We turn today to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3. In our last study, we were considering what Peter says about sharing in the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Christ suffered in the flesh, verse 1. Arm yourself with the same purpose, because if you suffer in the flesh, you will cease from sin. This was the reason why Christ never sinned. When he was tempted through the desires in his flesh, he denied himself and thus suffered in the flesh through the power of the Holy Spirit, thus never sinned. Thus he has opened a way through the flesh, a new and living way, as we read in Hebrews 10.20, for us to walk where we also do not sin, consciously, that we can spend the rest of our days, verse 2, to do the will of God, and not to satisfy the lusts in our flesh, which are called here the lusts of men. And then he goes on in verse 3 to say, that the time past, that is, the years that you spent before you were converted, is quite enough for having carried out these lusts of men, the lusts and passions that the pagans and those who do not know Christ live in having pursued a course of sensuality and lust, that is, sexual sin, an uncleanness, drunkenness, and drinking parties and carousals, and abominable idolatries, worshipping idols. Now, there is an emphasis whenever sin is mentioned on sins related to sex, and to idolatry and drunkenness in almost every list of sins of the flesh mentioned in scripture. These are the areas where we need to be particularly careful and idolatry does not mean merely the bowing down to idols of wood and stone but also the worship of money or pleasure, anything other than God taking the place that God should have in our life. And Peter says here, that the time past is sufficient for having lived like that. Now we should be so ashamed of having lived like that, that we never want to live a single moment of the rest of our days having anything of those practices in our life, not even in the slightest form, not even in our thoughts to fall in these areas. This is our calling, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We are told in 1 Peter chapter 2, that the reason why Jesus bore our sins in his body to the cross, to the tree, 1 Peter 2.24, was not just that we might be forgiven. When we read 1 Peter 2.24, we see that he bore our sins in his body to the tree, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That is the purpose. He died, no doubt, that our sins might be forgiven, but so that also we might die to sin, and he who is dead is freed from sin and live to righteousness, so that the time past that we have lived in evil is quite sufficient for having lived like that. And when we sin again in the future, that would be an indication if we deliberately choose to sin in the future, that is, that would indicate that we are saying that the time past that I have lived in sin is not sufficient. I want to sin some more. No, Peter says through the Holy Spirit, it is enough. Are you not ashamed that so many years you spent in sin? There is a great need for a hatred, for a deep hatred of sin to grow in our hearts, for sin to become exceedingly sinful, so that we see what a horrible thing it is to have lived in sin for so many years, so that that brings within us a great zeal and a great fire that burns within us, a fire of hatred against iniquity and sin in every form, so that we hate this flesh that tempts us to sin in so many ways. And we are ashamed that we lived so many years and we say, Lord, that is more than enough that we lived so many years in sin. No more do I want to live like that. 
And so we give it up completely, radically. We finish with it and cease from sin, as it says in verse 1. This is what a true repentance involves. And when we do not experience victory over sin, we can usually trace the cause to a shallow repentance. We need to see clearly that the years we have lived in sin are quite enough. There is no need to live one single moment of the rest of our lives anymore in sin. This is the gospel preached in the New Testament. And when we finish with all those evil things, we are told in verse 4, In all this day, that is, these Gentiles are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation and they malign you. In other words, your former friends, as it says in the Living Bible, will be very surprised when you don't eagerly join them anymore in the wicked things they do, as you used to join them in the past. And now they will laugh at you in contempt and scorn. And many young people particularly live a double life. One life in the presence of their fellow believers in the church and another life with their unconverted friends in college and elsewhere. Because they do not have the courage to stand up for Christ. The great need is for us to have courage given by the Holy Spirit so that when people laugh at us and scorn us for not sinning, that we have the courage to stand up. For what makes us a man is not that we yield and have experience in sin, but that we have self-control and can overcome these temptations. Our worldly friends may tempt us by saying, you're not a man, when they say that we do not go in to that excess of sin that they go into. But we need to realize that what makes us a man is obedience to God's word. And when we can overcome these lusts, it makes us an animal when we yield to these lusts. Animals live according to their lusts. They have no self-control. A man is distinguished from an animal by the fact that he can control himself. And this is where the fruit of the Spirit, we are told in Galatians 5.23, is self-control. A man who does not have self-control is just like an animal. He's not a man at all. And so we should be bold to stand up and be different from the unconverted around us. They will be surprised, no doubt, when they see that we don't take those advantages that come through cheating, which they do, that we don't take the pleasure that comes so freely, which they take, because we fear God. But that is the moment when Jesus will confess us before the Father, because we confess him before men. But it says here, they may malign you, they may laugh at you in contempt and scorn, but remember, one day they have to face the judge of all, the living and the dead. That day is surely coming. We read in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11, that because God does not punish sin immediately, therefore people continue to live in sin. But, that judgment is only postponed. It's not cancelled. One day, every person is going to stand before the judge of the living and the dead. When Christ comes and the millennium is established, we read in Revelation 20 that after that, the great and small, everyone will stand before the great white throne of judgment and the books will be opened and they'll be judged according to what is written in the books. Everything will be recorded. Every thought, every motive, every action, every word. Every idle word we shall have to give an account for. Everyone has to give an account in that day. And this is why we are told in verse 6, the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That means it was preached to them while they were still living. It doesn't mean that they were, it was preached to them after they died. They are dead now, but it was preached to them while they were living. So that although they are judged in the flesh as men, that is, they come to death finally like all men, they could live if they had responded to the gospel in the spirit according to the will of God. But where they did not respond to the gospel, then they die in their sins. But those who respond to the gospel can turn and cease from sin. And then they need not have any fear of standing before him who is the judge of the living and the dead. But this thought that every one of us shall have to give an account of the things done in our body is something that should bring a great seriousness and a fear in our lives so that we wholeheartedly and radically deal with sin and cease from sin quickly.